do it. Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our dear Queen of Heaven and Earth, once again, as your spiritual sons and daughters, we ask you, Queen Mother, that you would take us by the hand to your Son, the Divine King Jesus, through whom we have access to God our Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mary, as we reflect upon the biblical truths about you and your role in salvation history and who your Son Jesus Christ is and the role He plays in the Father's plan of salvation, may we grow in intimacy and in love with your Son Jesus. May we heed your motherly command to do what He tells us that whatever Christ calls us to, we may have the grace to do it. And so we ask you, Queen Mother, simply to pray for us. As we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so, we're coming off of talk two of our mission in preparation for the season of Advent and the season of Christmas. And talk two being Mary, the joy of Israel, Israel excuse me, the joy of Israel, both old and new. And if you recall, we reflected upon St. Luke's Gospel, chapter one, in the Annunciation Mystery. And we drew out of there several clues that point to the fact that Mary is the morning star of the messianic hope. That in and through Mary we have the ushering in of the fulfillment of all of the prophecies about the messianic age in which God's people and all of humanity would experience salvation. God's presence in the midst of his people a reunification of the 12 tribes of Israel, which includes the coming in of the Gentiles into God's covenantal family. And that inclusion of the Gentiles into God's covenantal family through faith in Jesus Christ, along with all of the ethnic Israelites who profess faith in Christ, that constitutes the new Israel. And so the message of hope, the message of joy in the Christmas story, in and through the Blessed Mother, is a message of joy not just for the ethnic Israelites who are waiting for their Messiah, but for all of humanity. Thus the title of the mission as a whole, Mary, the joy of Israel, the joy of humanity. For tonight's talk, we're going to continue following the lead of Holy Mother Church, as I mentioned last night, that in the third votive mass for the season of Advent for the Blessed Mother, the gospel text that Holy Mother Church gives us to read is the visitation mystery in Luke chapter 1. And so what I want to do tonight is I want us to uh, meditate on this visitation mystery and what we're going to see or several themes that flower out of this gospel text. And what I hope to show you is how each and every one of the themes that are flowering out of this gospel text points to the fact that Mary is the joy of Israel and the joy of humanity. And reading the new in light of the old. And so we might come across some things tonight that will seem a bit redundant of what we said last night. The same thing, but just in a different way, a different uh, clue or a different phrase, etc. But hopefully, this meditation on the visitation mystery can be fruitful for you in fostering your relationship with the Blessed Mother and ultimately your relationship with Jesus Christ, her Son our Lord and Savior. So let's start, and so the title of talk three is Mary the Mother of God and the New Ark of the Covenant. Uh, two major themes that we're going to be focusing on here in the Visitation Mystery as well as some others. So I'm going to start off and I'm going to read it to you very quickly here so we can get through it, familiarize ourselves with it, refresh our memory. 
And so just listen here. Luke chapter 1 verse 39. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a city of Judah. That's a key phrase there. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed, key word, with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, key phrase, <laughs> and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Another key phrase for the purposes of our reflection tonight. And why is this granted me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the voice of your greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his posterity forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home, end quote. There, we're going to look at five major themes, five major concepts here in this passage. Number one, Mary, the first theme that we see being coming out of this gospel text is Mary is the herald of the Isaiah Evangelion. The good news. By reading this text in light of the Old Testament prophecies. The second major theme that percolates out of this text. Mary as the mother of God. The third major theme, which will be the heart of our reflection tonight. Mary as the new ark of the covenant. Fourth major theme, we see something very interesting. Mary seems to be a new Judith conqueror of Israel's enemies. And the fifth major theme that we're going to reflect upon is Mary's Magnificat. We'll do a biblical exegesis of this prayer of the Blessed Mother. Okay? So let's start with our first theme. Mary, the herald of the Isaiah Good Tidings. The Isaiah Evangelion. Now, the, the clue that suggests this theme, this reality of who Mary is is in Luke 1.39, we read that she went to a city of Judah. The Old Testament backdrop against which we read this is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 through 11, where according to uh, the prophet Isaiah, the good news, the good tidings... The Evangelion, which is the Greek, is in the Greek version of Isaiah 40. In Latin, it's Evangelium. What do we call that in English? Gospel, good news. According to the prophet Isaiah, the Evangelion is to be made known to the cities of Judah. Here's what the prophet Isaiah writes. Verse 9, Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. So notice, herald of good tidings. The Greek word there for good tidings in the Greek translation of Isaiah 40 is ewangelion. So the idea of a gospel, the idea of good news, the idea of evangelium is found primarily in the Jewish tradition. And so when the New Testament authors and the apostles go around talking about the gospel, the evangelion of Jesus Christ, it's to be understood and read in light of the evangelion prophesied about by Isaiah. So here he goes on to write, what is the good tidings? He writes, lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Evangelion there again. Lift it up, fear not. 
Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Remember last night some of the prophecies we were reading? What was one of the central themes in the Messianic age? God dwelling in the midst of his people, right? So there we see it again. He goes on to write, The Lord God comes with might and his arm rules. The imagery of God's arm, mighty arm, calls to mind God's power, strength, and victory over the enemies of God's people. Verse 11, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young, end quote. So notice the Evangelion in the prophetical tradition of Isaiah is God dwelling in the midst of his people. God coming to rule with his mighty arm and might and power to bring victory God gathering his sheep and shepherding them like a shepherd shepherds his flock. You see? And to what city is this Evangelion to be proclaimed by the herald? The cities of Judah. And so it's against that prophetical tradition that we come to the visitation mystery and we see that St. Luke records this detail that Mary visits Elizabeth in a city of Judah. And I'm going to find that for you right here just to make the point. Verse 39, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a city of Judah. And so what we see, friends, is Mary being revealed to be this herald of the good news. The herald of the Evangelion. Amen? And so, in light of Isaiah's prophecy, in Isaiah chapter 40, what can we conclude here about Mary bringing the Evangelion to Elizabeth in the city of Judah? The fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy is in their midst. And so therefore, consequently, guess what? God is in their midst. The herald of the good news was to go and to say what? Behold your God. Mary goes to Elizabeth in the city of Judah and who does she bear within her? Elizabeth's God. Our God. God is dwelling in their midst. And so God is dwelling in their midst and guess what? With this Evangelion coming to fruition, God comes with might in judgment on the enemies of Israel. The true enemy being Satan and his demonic legions. Further, God is going to begin gathering the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So you see, in this visitation mystery, we have an explosion of revelation about what's happening here. The messianic age is upon us. The messianic hope is coming to fruition and fulfillment. God dwelling in the midst of his people, saving his people from enemy bringing about victory and regathering the lost sheep of the house of Israel, reuniting God's people. Unity. You see the theme of unity there. And so this is the beauty of this revelation of who Mary is, the herald of the good tidings, the Evangelion, the prophet Isaiah. So, getting back to this idea of the good news or the gospel, when the apostles go out and they start preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Evangelion of Jesus Christ. What they're proclaiming is Isaiah's prophecy is being fulfilled. God is in your midst, folks. That God is in flesh, Jesus Christ. God is bringing about salvation for you. Salvation from your sins. Salvation from the tyranny of the devil. Salvation from death for you shall rise in glory. As St. Paul would say, Oh, death, where is thy sting, right? St. Paul goes out preaching to the Jewish people that Jesus is the Messiah, regathering the lost sheep of the house of Israel, uniting them within him. The gospel of Jesus Christ includes, as St. Paul said, Jew nor Greek, male nor female, which means that the Gentiles are being incorporated into God's family. This is the good news. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Mary is the first herald of that gospel. 
She's the first evangelical. Amen? What does evangelical mean? It comes from evangelium, one who proclaims the good news. Are we as Catholics evangelicals? You better believe it. By nature we are. You've been baptized. You're an evangelical Christian. Which means you're called to be an evangelist. Amen? We're called to spread the evangelion, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And we can learn from our Blessed Mother. The first evangelical, the first evangelist, the first herald of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So folks, Mary was the first evangelist. She was the first bearer of the good news. And so we as Christians honor her for that. And we can look to her and learn from her example. Amen? Okay. So a beautiful meditation there. So we move right along. The second theme that flowers out of the visitation mystery is, <clears throat> excuse me, the fact that Mary is the mother of God. And what is our clue here? Well, our clue is when Elizabeth says, the mother of my God. Lord, in Luke chapter 1, verse 43. Now, somebody might say, well, Corlo, that doesn't say God. That doesn't say mother of God. That says mother of my Lord. So maybe perhaps Elizabeth was using the title Lord in reference to some sort of earthly potentate, like an earthly king of some sort, and not necessarily meaning Yahweh, God. How do we respond to that question? Well, we can respond to that question in two ways. The first way is by looking at the Jewish understanding of the title Lord. Keep in mind, Elizabeth, according to Luke 1.5, is a daughter of Aaron, which means she's of the tribe of Levi, which means she's a good, faithful Jew, an Israelite. And so she would know the Jewish tradition from which the title Lord comes and how they used it within their tradition, right? And in their tradition, according to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 5, Lord referred to Yahweh. As Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5 reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's how Lord is used in the Jewish tradition. Elizabeth's a good Jew. She knows how it's used in the tradition. And here she is saying, the mother of my Lord. Consequently, how is she using this title Lord? In reference to Yahweh, God. Thus, we can conclude Mary is the mother of God. And keep in mind, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, this text says when she exclaims this, the mother of my Lord. And so there we have the title of Mary, the mother of God there in Scripture. Now, the second way that we can demonstrate that Elizabeth is using this word or title Lord in reference to God is by looking at the context. Very, very interesting. In Luke chapter 1, verse 28, so we have Luke 1, 43, where Elizabeth says, the mother of my Lord, Amen. If we look to the passages before and we look to the verses after, we find the title Lord being used. And how is the title Lord being used within the context? Every single time in reference to Almighty God. Luke 1, 28, the angel Gabriel says to Mary, The Lord is with you. How is the angel Gabriel using Lord there? In reference to just some mere earthly potentate king or leader? No, he's using it in reference to God. Luke 1 32, the angel says, The Lord God, Kyrios Theos. The conjugation is probably a little bit different there, but those are the root words. Kyrios being Lord, Theos meaning God. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, right? How is Lord being used there? Reference to Almighty God. Luke 1 38, Mary says, I am the handmaid of the Lord. How is Lord being used there? In reference to God. Then you have Luke 1.43, the mother of my Lord, Elizabeth exclaims. Well, in Luke 1.46, Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Only three verses later. How is she using Lord there? In reference to God. Luke 1.58, 
Elizabeth says, The Lord had shown great mercy to her. The Lord. How is the title Lord being used there? In reference to God. And finally, Luke 1, 68, you have the canticle of Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. There we see Lord being used in reference to God. So notice, within the context of Luke 1, 43, and the verses before and the verses after, every time Lord is used, it references God. Therefore, when Elizabeth right smack in the middle of these texts says the mother of my Lord, it makes perfect sense to conclude that she's using Lord in reference to Almighty God. Thus Mary is the mother of God. As found in Luke 1, 43, when Elizabeth exclaims the mother of my Lord. Amen? So, remember that. Because there are many who will say... You know, Mary's not the mother of God. There are some who have a problem with this teaching of the Catholic Church. That Mary is the mother of God. Number one, they'll ask, where is it at in the Bible? They can't see it in the Bible. To which we turn to Luke 1.43. And we show that Elizabeth, filled by the Holy Spirit, exclaims the mother of my Lord. Lord referring to God. We got that, right? Now, let's do a little catechesis. I want to make just very briefly a few catechetical points about this understanding of the mother of God because many Christians, when they hear the Catholics say Mary is the mother of God, they will immediately conclude, well, if you say Mary is the mother of God, well, then you're saying she's divine. You're making a God out of her. You're putting her in the Godhead, the one divine nature. Is that what we're doing as Catholics? Is that what we mean when we say the mother of God? Or are we saying Mary is divine? No, we're not. So what do we mean when we say Mary is the mother of God? It's quite simple actually. Jesus is God. Amen. Mary is the mother of Jesus. Therefore, Mary is the mother of God. Well, let's go a little bit further. What, what do we mean theologically by that? Mary gave birth to a person, folks, right? Mary gave birth to a person and consequently she can be called mother because mothers, even though they're not the source of the total human nature of the person, you're a mother, amen? Are you a mother? Okay, you got some children? Now, are you the source of their soul? Did you create their soul? No, God did, right? But you're the source of their material element for their material element came from you, amen? But you're not the total cause of the human nature. Amen? And so do we say, well, mother of human nature of so-and-so? No, we don't say that, right? We just simply say mother. Why? Because a mother is, mother equals, female who gives birth to a person. A mother is one who births a person. Mary gave birth to a person. And she's not the source of his divine nature, nor is she even the source of his human soul, in reference to Jesus. She simply supplied the material element for his body, but she's not the source of his human soul. But yet, she can still be called mother because she gave birth to a person. Now, here's the key. Who is the person... That she gave birth to. A little bit more specific. The second person of the Trinity. The Son of the Father who is God. He possesses the very same nature as the Father and the Holy Spirit. So he's divine. And so the person to whom Mary gave birth to is divine. Consequently, we can say Mary gave birth to God because... In our, in our tradition, in our theological language, we can rightfully ascribe the term God in reference to either of the three persons of the Trinity. Because they all possess the same infinite divine nature. And so it's perfectly legitimate to say Mary is the mother of God. Because the person to whom she birthed, the person to whom she gave birth to, is the Son of the Father, who is divine. Is Mary the mother of the Father? No. Is Mary the mother of the Holy Spirit? No. And so do we say Mary is the mother of the Holy Trinity? No. Mary is only the mother of the Son. 
Because the subject of that human birth is the son of the father who takes to himself a human nature. Does that make sense? So when we're saying Mary's the mother of God, we're not implying that she's divine. She is mother simply because she gave birth to a person. And that person, the son of the father, is divine. And this is why we say Mary's the mother of God. Now just to give you a little historical background from which this came, there was a patriarch of Constantinople in the 5th century A.D., around 430 A.D., patriarch of Constantinople known as Nestorius. And he began preaching that Mary was not the mother of God. And he went around saying Mary's not the mother of God. Mary's only the mother of Christ, of the man Jesus. Because here's what he said. He said in Jesus there are two persons. A divine person and a human person. Okay? And he said Mary's the mother of the human person, not the divine person. Well, the bishops of the church came together at the Council of Ephesus in 431 A.D., and definitively, dogmatically declared that in Jesus there is only one person. Not two persons, one. And that person is divine. He is the son of the father who took upon himself a human nature. Mary gave birth to that person. Consequently, she can be called the mother of God. In Theotokos in Greek, the God-bearer. You see, as St. Paul, I think, writes in Galatians 4.4, 4, um, uh, a, a woman bore the Son of God. The Son of God was bore by a woman, and that woman being Mary. Okay? Now, why do I bring up all of this Christology stuff? Because remember what I said last night. All of our Mariology is what? Christocentric. It points us to Jesus, folks. And notice Nestorius, when he missed it on Mary, he missed it on Jesus. And his lack of understanding of who Jesus was led to a false assertion of who Mary was in her role. And so we see exemplified how Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. There's a common phrase that we often say, no Mary, no Jesus. Meaning in O. For if she had said no, would we have Jesus? Maybe, maybe not. But from the economy of salvation and the history of God's salvation, from Mary's yes, we have Jesus. Amen? No Mary, no Jesus. In O. No Mary, K N O W. No Jesus, K N O W. And we see that principle exemplified at the Council of Ephesus and talking about Mary as the mother of God. If I say Mary is not the mother of God, well then guess what? I logically make a her heretical statement, imply a heretical statement about who Jesus is. Amen? <clears throat> okay, now, we come to Mary as the new ark of the covenant. How can we draw out of the visitation mystery the fact that Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant? So the first question is, what are our clues? Okay, And then secondly, we're going to, after we establish the clues, we're going to ask, what's the significance? What's the significance of Mary being the new Ark? But first, let's just establish the reality. Now, what I want to do here in establishing Mary as the new Ark of the Covenant, we're going to look at the visitation mystery, and pull out the various clues there. But I'm also going to jump out of the visitation mystery and go to other places in sacred scripture. The Annunciation mystery and John's vision of Revelation chapter 12. And use those elements of scripture to combine with the visitation mystery, okay? So I know our reflection is on the visitation mystery. We're going to start there, but then we're going to look to other passages that reveal Mary as the new Ark of the Covenant. So we start with the clues in the visitation mystery. The first clue is that we see parallels with David's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The first piece of evidence to demonstrate that Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant in the Bible is 
is that in the visitation mystery, we see parallels between Mary and this event that's taking place, the visitation, and David's triumphal entry into, into Jerusalem. Here's the first parallel. In Luke 1.39, we read that Mary arose and went into a city of Judah. Once again, getting back to the city of Judah theme. Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 2, here's what we read. Then David and all the people who were with him set out for Biala of Judah to bring up from there, what? The Ark of God. The Ark of the Covenant was in a city of Judah to which David goes to bring the Ark to usher it in into the city of Jerusalem when David was capitalizing the city of Jerusalem for his kingdom. Another parallel. In Luke chapter 1 verse 42, St. Luke tells us that Elizabeth exclaimed with a loud cry. Exclaimed with a loud cry. Now the Greek word for exclaimed is anaphonesin. Everybody say that one. Okay. Anaphonesin. Why is this so important? Well, it's a very unique word. It's not used anywhere in the New Testament except one time, and it's here. In reference to Elizabeth exclaiming with a loud cry. Now, it's only used five times in the Greek version of the Old Testament. And three of those five times, particularly 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 28, and then also 1 Chronicles 16, 4 through 5, and 2 Chronicles 5, 13. In those passages, the Greek word anaphonesin is used in reference to the liturgical sounds of the liturgical instruments of the Levites in the presence of the ark. In 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 15 and 16, it's recounting the ceremony of David bringing the ark of God into Jerusalem. And in that procession, the Levitical priests are, proclaim, uh, are playing their liturgical trumpets. Their instruments. And the Greek word used to describe those sounds of the Levites and the presence of the ark is anaphonesin. And we come to the visitation mystery, folks. And here is Elizabeth, a Levite, daughter of Aaron of the tribe of Levi. Here's Elizabeth, a Levite, exclaiming with a loud cry in the presence of Mary, and the Greek word used for exclaiming is anaphonesin. Nowhere else found in the New Testament except here. What's the conclusion? That woman in whose presence Mary, uh, Elizabeth the Levite, exclaims anaphonesin with joy is the new ark of God. The new ark of the covenant. Amen? Isn't that a great parallel? Interesting. So in light of that Greek word anaphonesin, we see the parallel between Mary and the Ark of the Covenant. How did the Jews get around it? I don't know, Teddy. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, like we talked about it last night. Some Jews did get it. Some Jews did get it. Some Jews don't get it. Why is it that some Catholics get it? And some Catholics don't get it. Why is it that Catholics on a whole, as the church gets it, but non-Catholic Christians don't get it? God's grace, the movement of God's grace, the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's, 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 it's the grace of God. <laughs> That's all we can say. I mean, it's a very mysterious thing of why somebody can see a truth and somebody cannot see a truth. So, but thanks be to God for God's grace that Holy Mother Church has seen it for the past 2,000 years so that we can learn it today and see it. Yes, yeah, Scott? Oh, wow, I, I misspelt it, didn't I? I? Very good, you caught me there. Yeah, it's, it's the same word. I don't know why I put TH there. Uh, I'm going to have to check on that. I'm going to have to check in the Greek version on, in First Chronicles 15, 28. Uh, I, from my understanding, it's the same word. Um, sometimes, now, you bring up a good point. Sometimes what you will find is that the word will be conjugated different 
in the Old Testament, but it's the same root, so the connection is still made. But in this particular instance, I thought it was anaphonesin instead of anaphonesin, what I have on the PowerPoint. So I'm going to have to check into that, Scott. So thanks for pointing that out. Oh, and by the way, in talk one, someone pointed it out to me. I made a mistake on the PowerPoint. I hope I didn't scandalize anybody and lead anybody to heresy. Uh, because on the PowerPoint, I had uh, Mary and Eve, or Mary, yeah, Mary and Eve. And I put for Eve at the bottom, uh, fell into sin. And then I had on Mary's picture, fell into sin too. I forgot to change the wording. I copied and pasted the text box, you know. <laughs> uh, so hopefully not too many people saw that mishap there and led it to heresy, okay? Uh, but thank you, Scott, for pointing that out. I'm going to have to check on that. Uh, looking in my notes here to see what I have here in my notes. But I, I think it's just anaphonesin. Okay, so we move on to the third parallel. In Luke chapter 1, verse 43, we read Elizabeth exclaim, Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Very interesting. In 2 Samuel 6, 9, David says, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? Almost a verbatim quote of David from 2 Samuel 6, 9. And so we see a parallel there that Mary is this new Ark of the Covenant. In Luke chapter 1, verse 44, in the, at the salutation of Mary, Elizabeth says, the babe in her womb leaped for joy. At the salutation of Mary. Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 14 and 16, here's what we read. And when those who bore the Ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he, he that is David, sacrificed an ox and a fatling, Verse 14, And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. End quote. Notice, in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, David leaps and dances. Further, check this out. Notice how David offered sacrifice and he wore a linen ephod. What is that called to mind? priesthood. David was ministering as a priest. Why? Because he's a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. In Psalm 110, we find out that the son of David is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, which makes David a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And when you read the story in 2 Samuel 6, not only does he offer sacrifice of the oxen, but he offer, also offers a sacrifice of bread and wine. Sacrifice of bread, calling to mind the todah sacrifice, the thank offering. But the point being is that David here, presence of the ark, leaps, dances, and he's a priest. Amen? We come to the visitation mystery in the presence of Mary. John the Baptist, who is a priest, leaps for joy. What do you mean he's a priest? He's the son of Zechariah. Zechariah is a priest according to the order of Levi. That makes John the Baptist a priest. You see the parallel? Mary, folks, is the new Ark of the Covenant. You think this is a mere coincidence? I think not. I have a hard time believing that. And finally, in Luke 1, 56, we read that Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months in the hill country. Amen? Well, according to 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 11, we read, And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obedidim, the Gittite, how many months? Three months! Wow! An interesting parallel between Mary and the events of the ark of the covenant. And so what we see here in the visitation mystery is Luke is dropping us these clues and recounting this event. And what we see here revealed is Mary is this new ark of of the covenant. Lest anyone dismiss these parallels as childish or sort of out the ordinary or fanciful type of thing and not good biblical theology, well, actually it is good biblical theology according to the Christian tradition because we read the new in light of the old, amen? But if somebody is inclined to dismiss these parallels, all we got to do is look to the preceding context of the visitation mystery in which we find ourselves once again in the Annunciation mystery. Amen? And in Luke chapter 1 verse 35, we find our clue 
that connects Mary to the Ark of the Covenant. And that is this reality that the Spirit of the Most High will what? Overshadow Mary. That, my friends, and is, is an explosion of revelation of who Mary is as the new Ark of the Covenant. What is our evidence? Our evidence, as mentioned last night, the Greek word for overshadow, in reference to the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary, is episkiaze. And that's the same Greek word used in the Greek version of Exodus 40, 34 through 35, in reference to the Shekinah glory cloud, the Spirit of the Lord, descending and covering the holy tent of meeting, the tabernacle. When the ark was put in the dwelling place. God's Shekinah glory, His Spirit, did not cover the tabernacle until the ark was put in. And the Greek word there to describe that covering is episkiaze, same Greek word used by St. Luke in reference to the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary. That, my friends, is a clear parallel in order to show us that Mary is the new ark of the covenant. Amen? Isn't that great stuff? Beautiful. Now, we go even further. In light of this theme of the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary, right? The glory of the Lord. In light of the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary being connected to the glory of the Lord that overshadowed the dwelling place erected by Moses and Solomon's temple, what we see here revealed in this overshadowing is that Mary is the fulfillment of the Jeremiah prophecy. We can further see Mary as the Ark of the Covenant, not by simply connecting it to the dwelling place in Exodus 40, but we can see Mary as the new Ark of the Covenant here by making a connection to Jeremiah's prophecy about the return of the Ark. Where, we do, where do we find this prophecy? 2 Maccabees chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Now, if you're thinking Protestant, and if I'm dialoguing with a Protestant, they're not going to accept this text. To which I can say, well, maybe not. They won't accept it as the inspired word of God, and that's unfortunate because it is the inspired word of God, as always believed by Christians from the very get-go of 382 AD when Pope Damasus I definitively declared, the, exercising the keys of the kingdom, that these, this book was inspired. However, even though a Protestant doesn't accept it as inspired, they still must accept it as a legitimate historical record of Jewish tradition. And in this historical record of Jewish tradition, which we know to be the inspired word of God, we read this, the place shall be unknown. What is this talking about? This is Jeremiah speaking here. Remember, before 587 BC, uh, before the Babylonian captivity and exile, when Nebuchadnezzar came in with the Babylonian army and ransacked Jerusalem, destroying the temple, Jeremiah hid the ark. Okay? And there's, there's uh, Jeremiah's, the, if you read the whole context, you know, people are asking, where is it, you know? And here's what Jeremiah says, the place shall be unknown. Nobody's going to know of the place. Nobody's going to find the ark until, here's our keys, here's our clues. We're going to find the ark when God gathers his people together again and shows his mercy. And then the Lord will disclose these things and the glory of the Lord and the cloud will appear. Notice, folks, when the glory of the Lord returns, the cloud, the Shekinah glory, as it's commonly referred to, when that glory of the Lord reappears, because remember, when Solomon's temple was destroyed, guess what happened? We referenced this text last night, last night's talk. Um, it's the text, the citation slipping my mind, but it refers to the glory of the Lord leaving the temple. And so with the destruction of Solomon's temple, the glory cloud was no longer there. God's presence was not there. And Jeremiah is saying, when God's presence returns, then we'll find the ark. You see? The ark will be disclosed. It's in light of that prophetical tradition, folks, that we come to Mary. And St. Luke tells us, the angel Gabriel tells us, that the Spirit of the Most High, the Shekinah glory, the Spirit of the Lord will overshadow Mary. Guess what? God's glory has returned. 
And if God's glory has returned, there we find what? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark is being disclosed. We found it. It's not an it, it's a her. It's Mary, folks. In light of this image of the Spirit of God overshadowing her. So Jeremiah's prophecy has come to fulfillment in and through Mary. The ark has been rediscovered. And as we're going to see in a few moments when we make our conclusions, where the ark is, there's the presence of God. You see? Where the ark is, there's the presence of God. Don't talk enough about Jeremiah, huh? Yeah, he's a great prophet. Amen to that. All right. Now, before I get into the third piece of evidence in the Bible, so, so far we've looked at the visitation mystery, right? The parallels with David and the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, we've looked at the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit on Mary. It's our second piece of evidence for Mary being the new Ark of the Covenant. The third piece of evidence for Mary being the new Ark of the Covenant is in Revelation chapter 11 verse 19 and Revelation 12 verse 1 where John has the heavenly vision of the woman clothed with the sun. Now before I get into that, I want to go ahead, let's go ahead and take a break. We'll take a short break and get some goodies. And then when we come back, we'll pick up with John's account of the woman clothed with the sun and see how that woman, whom we know to be Mary, is being revealed to be the new Ark of the Covenant. Okay, God bless you.